So hello, everyone. Um, this is Cassandra Furman with the Arch National Respite Network, and we have um, a number of people here today. Uh, I'm so pleased. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like you to know that I received an email this morning at about 6 a.m. my time, and Kimberly uh, Whitmore, who was going to be presenting, was on her way to the hospital to the emergency room uh, because her son swallowed a Lego. Uh, those of us who have had children, <laughs> uh, you know the, that these things happen. So I just want to apologize to you that Kim won't be with us this morning. However, she wants to share about uh, the tearless logic model. And so we're going to put it off to the next meeting. And in the meantime, I am going to go ahead and share some of the information I was going to share uh, at the last performance measurement meeting when my computer cut out on me. And, and then we are so happy that we're still going to have Doris, Dina, and Abby from New York who are going to be talking about, um, let me go to the next slide, who are going to be talking about uh, working with an external evaluator. But before we get started, since we've had a, a shortened uh, meeting today, we will have a shortened meeting. I'd like to hear from everybody who's here. Uh, so we let's get started by just quickly going off mute and introducing yourself, what state you're from. We can be really brief. Uh, and then I've got a poll for you. So I'm Cassandra Furman with the Arch National Respite Network. Uh, why don't we start? I'm going to call your names from the names I see on my screen. I'm looking over there because that's where my uh, pictures are. Uh, so Dina, can you introduce yourself quickly? Sure, Dina Press from the New York State Office for the Aging. I am the project director for Lifespan Respite and also oversee our National Family Caregiver Support Program for the state. Thanks, Dina. Jill, you're next on the list. Most people know you, but say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Kagan with the Arch National Respite Network. Okay. Doris, you're next on my list. I am Doris Green with the New York State Caregiving and Respite Coalition. Hi, Doris. Uh, Nadine, you're next on my list. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, this is Nadine Walter. I'm out of Oklahoma, and Lifespan Respite Grant is one of the eight um, federally funded grants I oversee. So happy to be here. My regular staff person just had a baby on Friday, so I'm here filling in for her. Okay. Thank Is you. she okay? <laughs> Doing great. Great. Beautiful Wonderful. bouncing baby boy. Wow. Uh -huh. So exciting. She can look forward to the day that he swallows a Lego. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Tracy. Hey, I'm Tracy Sinowitz with Alabama Lifespan Respite Program. Hi, Tracy. And Corey? Hi, I'm Corey Lutz with Helping Hands of Vegas Valley and the Nevada Lifespan Respite Care Coalition. Wonderful. Marilyn. Hello, Cassandra. I'm Marilyn Sword with the Idaho Caregiver Alliance. Good to see you. Uh, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Summers, um, work for ARCH, longtime colleague of Cassandra's, and she and I were doing evaluation together back in the 80s and I love it so I'm glad to Great. be here we can't see you today for those of you who are <laughs> hiding themselves that's fine we won't force you but it's so nice to see your faces I put a nice sweater on but I'm still my pajama bottom so okay. there you go <laughs> okay uh, Brandon <clears throat> Yeah, I'm Brandon Ball. I come from the state of South Dakota, and I work for the Department of Human Services. Wonderful. Uh, Taylor? Hi, this is Taylor Perry. I'm an intern at the New York State Office for the Aging. Great. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, everyone. Oklahoma with Lifespan Respite. Um, I work with Ronell and Nadine. Glad to be Thank here. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Alita? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lita Nelson. I work with uh, Arizona Department of Economic Security with the Division of Aging and Adult Services. I also oversee the Family Caregiver Support Program and the Lifespan Respite Program. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. And Becky. 
Rebecca. And if you're talking, you're on mute. Sandra, she, she sent a, uh, a chat. So look in the chat from her. Okay, let's see here. I'm juggling two meetings at the same time. Okay, Becky, sociologist and gerontologist at the University of Utah. And Becky has already agreed to present at our next meeting. So there she is. There she is. We're really looking forward to that. Okay, and she's juggling two meetings. Man, I've been there. I don't want to do that again. Did I miss anybody? Okay, if I didn't miss anybody, we're going to start. I want to launch a quick poll. And this is related to um, related to uh, your collaborations with one another or your connecting with others. So we're just looking at whether or not the performance measurement or, or the uh, all of the learning collaboratives are or people are connecting before or after the meeting. So the first question is, since the last performance measurement learning collaborative, did you connect with anyone in the collaborative? And so just check all that apply, yes uh, or not yet. And if you, is the, the poll turning up on the screen? Yeah, good. And then the next question is, uh, what, what did you talk about? And we have three of you who participated yet. So if you, is, is everyone having uh, able to access the poll? I'm not sure if it's because you made me a presenter, Cassandra, but I can't, but that's okay. Oh, so the presenters can't. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Well, we'll have to take that into account. I am curious, have you, um, since the presenters, and I've got three of them who are active members, um, maybe you can just tell us, have you been connecting with other people? We've talked within our own network about evaluation planning. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> you, we, your own network within the state, you mean? Yes. Or, okay. <clears throat> well, we're going to go with this and we have another poll at the very end of the meeting and it'll be about, um, about what you would like for future topics. And you'll recognize a lot of the items that are on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and we will share results. And I'm hoping that, um, Jill, this will be captured in our recording and we'll have access to it. But it looks as if uh, three, four, five, most of you are, 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 have not yet connected, but I wanna encourage you, if someone says something that sparks your interest, please, uh, please feel free. And I'm certain all of us are happy to talk with other people about our work, but feel free to make connections uh, afterwards. And it looks as if developing measurement tools might be the one that people are the mo talking the most about. And actually today, uh, the, our New York friends are going to be talking a little bit about developing measurement tools. So um, let's, let's see what we learn as we go through. And in fact, what I'm going to be talking about is somewhat related. So I'm going to close out of that poll. And uh, again, for those of you who were late joining, um, we have had to change the agenda because uh, we were unable to, um, Kim was unable to join us. So I'm going to talk a little bit right now about some of the resources uh, that we have available uh, for, for uh, helping you with evaluation and developing logic models. I'm not going to open this up. Uh, Ray did talk about it during the last meeting and that is Arch's, uh, guidebook on measuring systems change and consumer outcomes. It's really easy to access. It's on the ARCH website. 
And it basically, not only does it talk about uh, uh, how to, to make, to plan your evaluation for measuring performance, it gives some uh, potential outcomes, almost a menu of outcomes and indicators you could select from. And it also has links to evaluation tools that uh, have been used by um, lifespan respite grantees. Now, Jill, in the past, I think we had some hard copies available. Do we still have hard copies? Uh, yes, we do, but um, I, I don't know if you're gonna talk about having changed some of the links, but um, we are gonna um, be updating it with better, with uh, updated links as well. But I do have hard copies if anyone would still yeah. like one. And some also, of the links, yeah. Cassandra, I just wanted to mention, are you able to show your slides and slide show? Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the things I was troubleshooting this morning. Whenever I did it, my computer crashed. And that oh, okay. is why you're seeing it like this. Okay, no um, problem. I've been up since six this morning trying to make sure my computer was operating as it should. So I do apologize for that. Uh, but I, I recommend I could go to the page uh, on, but I think I'll, I'll skip that right now because we did talk about it the last time. The other uh, resource that I'd like to share with you on developing logic models and creating evaluation plans comes from our partners, the Friends National Center on Community-Based Child Abuse Prevention. And even though it's really geared towards uh, working with children, it's very adaptable to um, working with adults and older adults. And I'm just going to show you, I'm gonna open this hyperlink, show you a little bit on this, uh, on the Friends website that is useful. You'll see that I went to the evaluation page and we have a link to logic models. In the logic models, I mean, there's lots of information on developing logic models, all of it it is applicable, not just for children, but across the age range. We have in it a menu of outcomes and indicators, and I'm gonna show you how this works, where you can actually, if you're trying to decide what kind of outcomes are we trying to target? Well, hopefully you already have some general ideas, but if you're looking at how to tailor those, you might want to look here, and we actually have added outcomes, especially related to respite. So we have quite a menu here of outcomes and indicators. For example, first one, and I'm not going to take- Sandra, I, I don't want to interrupt you. We're not seeing the logic model builder. Oh, you're not seeing it at all. No. I think you have to stop, share, and then- And reshare again. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Let me see, I stopped share and now I'm gonna share again and it will be, um, okay, here we go. Share screen and I'm going to, think this is it, share. Do you see it now? Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go back and just show you where I went uh, on the menu of outcomes and indicators on the evaluation toolkit. As you can see, I come down here and I have a search engine. You can select different things you can search from, uh, parenting skills, child abuse, but I'm, I'm choosing respite. I'm going to look at long, intermediate or long-term outcomes for respite. I search the results, and as you can see, uh, we get um, outcomes and indicators that are related to respite. So I'm going to just, I think I, respite, get results. Here it is. So there is increased access to respite resources for family caregivers. That's applicable across any age group, uh, caregivers and parents have increased levels of confidence 
as a result of receiving respite services. So we have a whole menu of outcomes and indicators that you can peruse and possibly use. Is that, uh, I'm sorry, Cassandra, is that please. link in the, men, in the agenda? Uh, no, but you know what? I think we can put it, uh, Valerie, or Valerie, uh, Jill, are you able to put that in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, but I will put it in the agenda. And how about I just send something out to everybody after this meeting with those links? The other uh, evaluation related uh, item is um, the compendium of annotated measurement tools. So maybe you've identified some outcomes you wanna measure and you wanna, you may not wanna develop your own tool before you see if there's something else out there already in existence that you might wanna to use to measure your outcomes. So we have information and this is the compendium of annotated measurement tools. As you can see, uh, these are primarily uh, for children, but many of them are used across the lifespan. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to go down here and choose respite again. And I'm just going to look at all of the results. Any tool that has any relationship at all to respite outcomes. So there's a broad number of tools here will turn up on this. So if we, and we've, so here's the caregiver self-assessment self questionnaire. Family crisis oriented personal evaluation skills. You see, we have a number of tools. We selected our tools on two things. One, it needed to have psychometric data behind it. So there needed to be some kind of research that says, yes, this is a reliable and valid tool. The other, other criteria we used was maybe it hadn't been well researched yet, but it was used in the field a great deal. It came endorsed by programs. So we basically looked at the practice-based evidence that this was a tool that was very useful to programs. But we will state that, I'm gonna just show you. We have all the information and I know Susan helped develop some of this. So I checked, clicked on the caregiver self-assessment questionnaire and you see um, target ages and populations. It was designed for adult caregivers. Uh, we have what kind of uh, content is in it, the protective factors, and it includes respite in this that we're, being, we're measuring what kind of a tool it is, and then uh, information on the psychometrics, and then what does it cost and how do you access it? So I think these are, uh, th th this is the sort of information you can get that, that is useful um, in developing logic models and figuring out ways to measure your outcomes. Are there any questions before we move on to our New York presenters? Okay, well, I'm just, I'm, I'll make sure that you get a link to that, Marilyn, and anyone else who's interested, because it's very helpful. And so I, I, yes? I have a question. This is Lita with Arizona. Um, hi, hi, I know there's a lot of work right now with the RAISE Caregiver um, Advisory Council at the federal level, also with grandparents raising um, grandchildren. Um, are there talks or communication with them about these existing tools? Because I know they are trying to develop a uniform um, process for evaluation of not just the FCSP, but different components of the program. Uh, I, I'm wondering, has this conversation taken place with them, with Lori and her team and ACL, or is there consideration for possibly utilizing or sharing this resource with them? I, I don't know about that. I'm wondering, Jill, can you address it? Lori was going to be on the call, but I don't think she's joined us yet. Uh, but Jill, do you know anything about that? Um, I don't know about the Ray's Council work related to this specifically, even though I, I am faculty to the Ray's uh, Council, I can certainly find out, but we work very closely with ACL 
on development. I mean, if there are any measurement tools that are going to be used for lifespan respite in particular, we will be involved in that process so, and we'll keep you informed and, and current. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Lita. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'll let you know if anyone has any questions, if you want me to explore this uh, in greater detail, feel free to reach out to me. My, I, I respond to phone calls. I answer emails. I'm happy to, to tell you more about it if you have any interest. Um, and without further ado, what I am going to do is pass this over to Doris and Dina and... Um, I don't know if your other partner is with you yet, but Doris and Dina, if you would like to take over, you may share your screens and talk about working with an external, external evaluator. Great, thanks, Cassandra. Unfortunately, Abby had a conflict today, so I don't think she's gonna join. If she does, it might be at the tail end, so um, she won't have an active role in per, um, presenting, but thank you for having us. We're delighted to be able to share um, what New York has been doing in our approach when it comes to evaluation for lifespan respite. I'm gonna kick things off. Doris is gonna talk a little bit more about some of the specifics. We don't have a PowerPoint presentation. We felt the best approach would be to just kind of talk through our process, but please stop us at any point with questions. I know it's a small group, so we should be able to do that easily. Um, there are a few documents that are um, evaluation plan and our evaluation report that we thought we would kind of walk through and just kind of show you exactly what we've done for previous um, projects. We just finished up, we did have a one year no cost extension for the 2017 to 2020 grant. So it went through 2021. So we just submitted our final report for that. That did include the evaluation uh, report from our external evaluator. So we'll be sure uh, to get that to everybody um, in follow up if that's okay. So when, and this is before me because I came on board in, um, Oh my gosh, Doris, a year after you, I think, like 2017. Um, so our very first grant in um, 2010, uh, I think that, you know, um, the, the core, and I'm going to back up and just kind of give you a little bit of understanding of our structure here. We have what we call a core team. Um, the New York State Office for the Aging is the applicant, is the state unit on aging that um, applies for this award, but we do it in partnership with our, you know, our formal partners. Um, the Monroe County Office for Aging has been on board with us since the very beginning in 2010. Lifespan of Greater Rochester, which is where the New York State Caregiving and Respite Coalition is housed. Um, so they had some discussions back then when we were applying for the grant and really came down to feeling that it was extremely important and critical to work with an external evaluator. Um, and some of the, the rationale with that was because they really felt like um, it would be unbiased, you know, having somebody that was not um, fully connected to the project could be able to really evaluate the success or failure of the program without feeling like there was some sort of, you know, um, economic stake or, you know, so um, we've been structured this way since the very beginning. Of course, we've been fortunate because Dr. Caprio, which many of you heard during the Respite Research Summit, um, you know, brilliant man, um, and he has been agreeable to work with us with every single grant. Um, we never know if that's going to be the case. So the way that we always draft it in our project narrative is you know, saying an external evaluator that we will pursue contracting with an external evaluator. We don't name him because we don't know if he's going to be agreeable to continuing to work with us. But that has been very helpful because he's obviously been on board since the beginning, right? So he doesn't have a learning curve. He knows the progress that we've made, which I think has been really um, beneficial. Um, so, and one of the things we thought might be a question because we met and kind of talked this through and was trying to predict some of the questions you may have. Um, we selected him. It wasn't really a competitive process, but he was he was uh, doing some work and connected to the New York State Office for Aging. But with his, you know, background and his expertise, um, you know, when we decided to kind of go this route, it, we made the recommendation to Lifespan of Greater Rochester of pursuing that conversation to see if he would have interest. Um, but 
so that's kind of just like how he was the one who kind of was targeted, I guess you could say, in becoming involved with it. Um, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I cover everything. He is at uh, University of Rochester, correct, Doris? Um, and he, um, you want to talk a little bit about just what his title is? Because I know you know more about that. I think he has about 15 titles. So uh, <laughs> he is, uh, he's the director of the geriatric uh, something. He has students under him and he, he runs the geriatric department at University of Rochester, which is a, a big, big hospital. So um, I, I don't know how he finds time for us, but he does. And we're grateful for that. Um, but he does know his stuff. And you can tell whenever we're with him, because we do um, use him for other things. Uh, he facilitates our annual um, sustainability summit that we started doing, or um, no, yeah. retreat, we call it, because <laughs> we don't want to get mixed up with our summit. No. Um, we do a sustainability retreat every year with just the core team, and he helps us focus. We've been using the Arch Toolkit and working through all the modules, and um, you know, but you can see the passion come through where he really believes in this and making sure that we're bettering things for family caregivers. So that that's been in our favor too, because he is a very busy man. Um, but so our approach, just so um, I can kind of lay it out, um, when we get a, a you know a grant opportunity with Lifespan Respite, we'll come up with the vision and idea. Um, we'll kind of talk through like what we feel should be um, our expected outcomes, and we will we'll draft our logic model. So we do all of that without Tom involved. We want to kind of like present a picture and a package to him and see if he thinks it's reasonable. So that's kind of how we approach it. Um, so we kind of have an informal commitment at that point of him saying, yes, I'd be you know, willing to stay on as the formal evaluator. Um, so like this, the most current grant that we were just awarded in July, you know, back when we were applying in May, um, we drafted everything, sent it off to him. He took a look. He made a few suggestions when it came to maybe some of the measurement tools or some things to consider. Um, as an example, um, we're doing something a little out of the box with this grant and piloting a caregiver wellness and respite center. So he had suggested not only measuring the work that this caregiver wellness and respite center is going to be doing um, as far as service delivery, but he also felt like it would be important to take a look at the actual implementation right and thinking about like what you know how how we went about implementing this project that that would be another area um to take a look at as far as measuring success um so um with that said uh now i think i'll share my screen just to kind of show you so then in our first year of any of our grants he then will uh as part of his contract and doris is going to kind of get into this more um with just talking through, that's the report. He prepares for us a, a program evaluation plan. So it comes to us as a draft and um, basically, you know, he lays it out uh, in a similar format as the report where it starts with our project title, the period, all the stakeholders, um, you know, him as the evaluator and it gets into the table of contents provides a nice introduction and background. And then he goes into the evaluation outline with just, you know, uh, listing our goal and the period again with the proposed intervention and our major grant objectives, um, composite outcome, the key products, and then our work plan, which also has the logic model. And then here um, he goes into the indicators as Cassandra was kind of talking about. So, um, you know, he, I, I think when you look through this, it's very comprehensive. He lays it out very nicely, easy to read, um, clear. And then here's our logic model. Tina, could yeah. you go, I, I don't know if you're going to do this. I would like to, could you go back and read some of your outcomes or, or let us look at it a bit longer? I can't read that fast. Yeah, yeah, no, that's sure I can. I thought when we got to the um, the actual evaluation report, it would have the outcome and then we okay, could talk about like fine. whether we were able to achieve it or not. But um, I know I, I tend to go fast, so please slow me down. I, Doris will tell you sometimes like, Dina, slow your roll. <laughs> 
And can you tell us, you, you came up with these outcomes prior to meeting. I just want to clarify, prior to meeting with Dr. Caprio. Yeah, we have tweaked them though. Like when we present him with something, he is very good about um, saying, well, I think, you know, you might want to actually word it this way, or you might want to consider this instead because it might make it more achievable. Like, you know, he's really good about um, helping us with his expertise because, you know, we're the big thinkers, but sometimes I feel like we need his um, expertise in just getting us to really maybe narrow it down more, if that makes sense, because we're big in our thinking. Um, so. Thank you. Sure. I, um, so then after the logic model, uh, he does provide recommendations, which is nice. And, um, you know, talks about the data collection and the process measures and then um, goes into data collection and analysis recommendations, which I think for, for us kind of doing the work, right? And making sure that we're moving this project forward, like this, this gives us a, something to work off of and a path to follow along with our other um, tools for tracking. But I just think, you know, it's, it's really uh, helpful right at the beginning of, 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 a, of a grant. Then and I'd like to wait until the end for questions. And I'm so sorry. I have I have another question. No, that's okay. Please. Yeah, please. Stop. <laughs> and I, and get plenty gonna, of time, it sounds like. So yeah, of course. Yeah. Dina, if you don't mind, I would like to, if, if it's okay to invite others, if they have comments as we go along uh, to, or questions. But did you at any point, uh, if you go up to the page right before, I think it's page seven. Okay, these recommendations. At any point, did you feel overwhelmed? Did you say, oh man, that's too much? Or uh, were there issues about that? Or did you feel, you know, just talk to me about that. And the reason I asked this question is I know a lot of programs feel overwhelmed with the idea of evaluation. What were your feelings and how did you address that? I wouldn't say overwhelmed. I think, and Doris, please chime in too, but I feel like we work so closely as a team. And then when we pull Tom in, even though he's not really part of the core team, we do still kind of consider him like a branch off our team, right? And we meet and we talk things through and we really make sure that there's a comfort um, with anything that's being proposed, you know? So, and he's wonderful about, um, giving us some explanation if we feel like, oh, this isn't making sense to us, or you know, could you like help us understand what your thinking is here? Um, but Doris, I don't know if you have more to add, but I wouldn't say overwhelmed ever. No, I wouldn't say that I feel overwhelmed when we have the evaluation plan, the overwhelm comes in the actual trying to get the data collected and all okay. of that. that. I mean, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story, but um, yeah, I, I would say when the plan is submitted to us, it all it tends to make sense, at least by the time we finalize it, we're all very clear on it. Great. And actually, I would say I would say more excited, right, because yeah. you have right like the, these ideas and even though you have it all laid out in a project narrative when you're kind of like looking at it like this, where he is feeding it back to you in a very different format, it kind of gets you excited about like doing the work, right? And, and trying to accomplish these things and having the outcomes that you've laid out. And I see that I've got a raised hand here. I think it's Corey. Corey? I was being polite. Um, oh, <laughs> otherwise you. I would have just jumped in. Um, how, how do you guys collect all this information? I mean, do you use volunteers? What do you, <laughs> mm -mm. Doris, <laughs> I love you. Um, and I was just going to kind of talk about this um, be, um, later in the presentation, but um, we've changed the way that we collect the data and talking about being overwhelmed, it's when we don't feel like we have enough staff support to get all the information to follow up with people who are supposed to be reporting to us. That is the big challenge, getting people to do what they've agreed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we, when the pandemic started, we lost staff who went to do caregiving because her mom was so isolated. And, you know, it was just really difficult in those, 
in that time. We have since hired uh, someone who's very good with data, who's very um, focused on following up with people and making sure that they're doing their reporting in a timely way. She's redone all our uh, data into one access database and she's put in made Google Docs that just dump right into her spreadsheets that pull that she can pull reports out of access. I mean like everybody needs my Karen. That's all I can say. Can I have yeah, I know. Jet, only for like a month just to get uh, yeah, I know. I know. Um, so we're really yeah. excited. We're really excited about uh, being able to manage our data better. To, because ultimately, I mean, uh, my agency contracts with the evaluator and it's our job to hand him all that data in aggregate so that, you know, he's not going to sort through surveys and stuff like that. That all has to be uh, put into really neat um, uh, data files for him. So that when you say overwhelmed, that's, that's where we were feeling overwhelmed and it was directly related to not having a really good process and not having consistent staff to do the work. Uh, yeah, I can. But we're feeling better. Me just doing surveys on top of the other stuff, but I am overwhelmed doing that. And that's just control pace doing the other, but then I have to get the surveys and put the data in. And it's just. I know. For four or 500 people, I couldn't imagine the entire state. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about what it is that we collect at this point, Dina, or do you want to just continue and? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I'm at the tail end of this anyway, because that's exactly how we were going to lay it out. I was going to just talk about our approach with getting the evaluation plan and that, you know, within that first year of the grant. And um, then I was going to turn to Doris to actually talk about the data collection. And then we were going to take a look at the evaluation report that comes out at the end. So I think we were, we're right here at the end. This was interesting just for this grant. There was like a little project status that he included in here, um, which I thought was helpful, right? With just showing building on from the previous grant and some suggestions because we did have a transition with a new director. This is when Doris was coming into the position. So he included that, which was good. Um, and I think that that was it. I think that that's the end and then just the appendix. Uh, appendix. So yeah, why don't you take it away, Doris? Okay, so one of the things that the coalition does, first of all, the other piece is that Tom is our evaluator, so I'll refer to him as Tom uh, or Dr. Caprio. He uh, is local to us uh, here in Rochester, and so he we're ac he's accessible to us, which was one of the things. Dina is in Albany in the state capitol, um, so it does help to have him uh, local, so I'll just say that. One of the things that we do every year is mini grants. So we put out mini grants. Um, they are specifically for the development or growth of programs that use volunteers to provide respite. And so um, a lot of them are faith-based communities um, and some are, we have more this year that are more uh, offices of the aging um, kind of grants. But that's where, especially when you're using faith-based communities, um, they don't have a lot of experience with uh, even invoicing or data collection. Um, so it, it requires a lot of support for them. And when we didn't have the staff to do that, I felt like we, you know, we really got behind the eight ball. Um, so we asked them to report caregivers served in their respite programs. Um, the number of people, the volunteers who are providing respite, the hours of respite that are being provided. And we've really kind of tried to clarify that going with unduplicated. So we're asking them every month now, are these new people to your program or are these people who are just showing up month after month? Um, and we ask, and we have a post respite survey under the mini grants. and. Um, we ask them for two reports uh, halfway through the grant and at the end, really reporting what their activities are and you know what their thoughts are on sustainability and whether um, they think that the that the caregivers have really benefited. And of course, they always say that they've benefited, but to really give us some personal stories as well. Um, the other thing that we do require in the mini grants is that we uh, train 
either train the trainers for the organization or we train the volunteer, the volunteers directly. We use the REST model, which is respite education and support tools. We continue to use that. I don't know about you, Corey, if you kind of gave up um, when REST kind of went offline and said, well, you can continue to use our stuff, but we're no longer going to support you. So we have continued to use them. I know that Nevada was using them in a much richer way. They were doing all the reporting for Nevada. So I'd be interested, some maybe even offline, Corey, but. Uh, I was going to say uh, that was a Duncan thing, but I know RSVP, the uh, Rural Services Volunteer Program, still uses that model. Okay, um, great. I don't know if anybody else is using it. I know I've asked about it with Duncan and haven't gotten much results. So Gotcha, gotcha. But we continue to use it um, as a consistent way to train uh, volunteer respite companions across the state. We also uh, track which counties we have active trainers in so that we can kind of tr keep track of where they are and where they need to be supported and where we might need to re-intervene. We lost a lot of trainers and companions during COVID, of course, so it's kind of a rebuilding uh, process. But REST um, <clears throat> was evidence-informed, so we do use their pre and post surveys because they are available to us. Um, we do the caregiver, we continue to do the caregiver simulation, obviously not since COVID hit, but we, uh, we use a pre post uh, in the caregiver simulations. We use, uh, we collect evaluations and satisfaction data on any trainings that we do out in the community, along with demographic information for all our trainings. Um, and so we're collecting data all over the place. Um, we also track growth in our newsletter distribution, our Facebook page, our Twitter account, because we know uh, that that is a great way to get information out. So we are, uh, we track that on a quarterly basis. So um, one of the things that we talked about, or we, we are talking about is the development of evaluation tools. And we've gone about it in a couple of ways um, with our evaluator. evaluator. Um, <clears throat> we're starting a new uh, voucher model, January 2nd. It's launching, so we're really excited and we're in the thick of that. We did a lot of research on other evaluation tools that current voucher programs were using and kind of uh, developed what we're using from that information. So it wasn't necessarily um, respite or caregiver satisfaction as much as um, using the voucher program, what the caregivers are going to be doing for their respite, was it helpful for them, those kinds of things, so that we can see if the intervention is obviously helping caregivers uh, do a better job at living their lives in a sane way and um, giving better care. I love that compendium of, um, annotated measurement tools because when we do the research for those kinds of, of tools, it's a lot of work and it's, it's overwhelming and confusing to try and keep track of all of them. So this looks like an awesome tool. So I just, um, I'm glad to hear about that. What else, what did I miss, Dina? <clears throat> Oh, we're also going in our new grant for our Caregiver Wellness Center, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to use T-Care, which is a case management kind of tracking tool. Um, so they're gonna use that and they they're also have purchased the Truolta, which is the caregiver training. And both of those platforms offer a multitude of reports where we can pull evaluation out of those. So <clears throat> we're looking forward to um, starting using those programs as well in the new grant. which won't start till July, right, of 2022? Well, um, we're in a planning year, which is where Tom went. How about, how about we look at, you know, how you're implementing this? Um, yes, for the most part, yes. They're hiring someone in February, so they're, we're gonna get them up to speed and start using um, T-Care and Truolta as soon as possible. 
can you, you, you mentioned developing your own tools. Are you able to share those uh, with others so we can just get a sense of what you're working on? I could share them, not this second, because I didn't pull well, them up and I don't want to search no, my files. Um, sure, we'd be happy to do that. I mean, there's the, and I'll just put it all in one email to you, Cassandra, if you want to share it with the group, that's fine. Um, most of them have been shared too, I think, right, with Jill for posting. I feel like some of a them lot of it's been shared. shared. A lot of it's yeah. on our web on the Arch website. Yeah, yeah the link I posted earlier, and I just posted another one about state tools. Um, some of them are up there, and also those REST evaluation tools, the pre and post surveys, come pretty much directly from evaluation work Cassandra did. Okay, twenty years ago, those <laughs> yep. are Cassandra's forms. So. What goes and, around comes around. And we are very involved in the partnership with Wisconsin to do the virtual uh, respite worker training. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we're also very excited that that platform uh, is able to collect all that data without us having to do a whole lot of extra work. Um, but we are really looking forward to rolling that out, I think probably in February. We have another call this afternoon. So wonderful. And I know that. Go ahead. Could I, this is Susan. Could I ask a question? Sure. So I, you know, I write up these, the state progress reports and key accomplishments. And so I've wanted to ask, ask this question about New York for a long time, because New York's really creative. All these things, they're always branching off and, you know, there's all this growth and it doesn't seem random. It, to me, it always seems really logical. So I've always wondered how you use your evaluation information to inform strategic planning, writing new grants, uh, sustainability planning. So, you know, once you gather those data and you have this evaluation report, then like what, what happens? How do you use it? Well, one of the things is, is that we are in constant communication with our evaluators. So if we're thinking about taking on a new project um, we will talk with him about that. Uh, it helps to keep us on track. I mean, you want to, for me, I, you want to be careful to not follow the money and, and not and lose your way in what your mission is, um, because a lot of the work that the coalition is doing, it doesn't necessarily come under the lifespan respite uh, dollars that we're able to use other funding um, to build our programs. So, um, I think it's just really helpful to have Tom's ear as we think about each and every new project that we're going to take on. And I can't speak um, too in depth on this, but because uh, I wasn't involved at the time, but I think to your point and what you're raising, Susan, we did have an experience where we went after trying to do something that involved working um, with Medicaid and it was a uh, data sharing and there were issues with it and unfortunately we weren't able to you know accomplish what we had set up to accomplish um and I think what we ended up doing was what it was like a lesson learned of like I think some of that should have been handled prior to applying for the grant of seeing if you know what those barriers were with the data sharing and if we could have maybe spent some time in resolving whatever issues there were um, so that we still could have, you know, gone after what we were trying to achieve. Um, but I also think it presented an opportunity, right, to then go and talk to our sister agency to be able to say, like, unfortunately, we weren't able to do this because of X, Y, Z. Um, you know, how can we set ourselves up for allowing some of, you know, this opportunity where we can work more closely, right, moving forward with breaking down those barriers for a good system. Um, so I, I, I see that as far as like the evaluation report and kind of highlighting where we struggled or there, where there were issues that we couldn't achieve what we wanted to, it gives us that uh, ability to have like the write up, right? To kind of share and show what they were and how can we break those barriers down, make it better in the future. Yeah, and a great answer. Thank you. I also think it's important to have a really good running record of, you know, the activities because I, <clears throat> that was before me, Dina, that was before you, but we still know about it because it was on paper and it's in our archives. 
And I think like anything else, if you, you know, feel like you could have done something better or you feel like there was a mistake, you, unless you remember it, unless you're aware of it, you're bound to repeat it. So um, I think having a good solid written record is the only way to go. It reminds me of something that Susan brought to my attention many years ago, and it was from, um, from Alice in Wonderland. And the king is saying, uh, I shall never ever forget. Mm -hmm. And the queen says, you will if you don't make a memorandum of it. <laughs> and it, uh, it I, I used to use that when I would do training on you know, implementing. You will, you, you know, keeping records for the next person who, it, it, for yourself, of course, because I forget what happens from minute to minute, but certainly for the people down the road. Isn't that the queen that also liked to say off with your head? I was reading, <laughs> I was reading that to my granddaughter the other day. That's funny. <laughs> now that's my favorite line to her. I just go off with your head. <laughs> Nadine looks like she has her hand raised. Oh, who's Nadine? Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Doris and Dina, we always like hearing from you. You guys do great work and, and thank you for everything you've shared with us with Oklahoma. Um, how do you find a tone? How did you find him? How do you, was there a connection with you, Doris and him? Or how do you, is he considered an evaluator? Do you just go out and advertise for an hour? Well, as Dina, as Dina said, he had done some work with the New York State Office for Aging. They suggested him to my boss, who's the president of Lifespan. She had a relationship with him because he's here locally and works in the geriatric world. Um, so it just kind of all fell together, I think. But it's the same as how do you find a Karen, this person that I've just hired, who's turned our lives around um, in being able to collect data in a really efficient manner. I don't know. She stumbled into my lap and and I, I think it's connections. And I think you have to, you know, talk to the people. Uh, I said this to someone recently who was looking for it. And I go, you, you know, maybe you just Google evaluators in your area <laughs> and yeah. see who does evaluation work. I, in another program, I worked with an evaluator who, um, who had a, a, a prior career in entomology. So she studied bugs, but she was... <laughs> all over data and she just went into business for herself and she was great so i don't i don't know the answer to that i'm wondering if susan and rebecca have some suggestions because well, they yeah. both have worked at universities yeah when i was when i was at the you said at university of washington i was for a while as associate director and i would just get people calling in and i would match them up with people you know um, university types love to be out in the community helping. And that's like, that's a good gig. <laughs> and they also may have students that are dying for um, a topic for a, a right. master thesis or a doctoral dissertation. So, you know, it's really a, it's really a win-win. So yeah, call, call your local university and see if, you know, anybody does that kind of work and interview them and see if you, if you work well. The thing about when I'm listening to the description of Dr. Um, Caprio, he's just this very kind man, but he's brilliant. And um, Doris, you were talking about how the proximity and accessibility. So it's not just their skill, it's like how they work with you and if they're available right. to you and that longevity over time. I mean, that's really special. That's really a great thing, but think about that. I think that's the key. That's what I'm looking for, that longevity. That's somebody that, not a student, that's going to be here for a year and gone again. Right. We need that. We need that longevity. And that's, that's where I'm struggling a little bit. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, and, we're on mute for a second. Were you going to add to that? Well, I, I was just going to give another perspective of how to incorporate students. So you could have kind of a revolving door of students. If you set up a program, almost like an internship, where you could always get a new student each semester or each year that is doing this work for you. And so I take a little bit of effort to set up sort of what you need in terms of the evaluation and what you want to do on an ongoing basis, and then pitch it to, um, to these students as an internship that they can just sort of be the workhorse that you need um, for somewhat of an independent um, 
time period. Have you used, have you had an evaluator in that situation as an intern that rolls over every, have you used that? I mean, I, I've got the statistician and all that, but I need that evaluator that. Um, I have worked with a couple of community partners, community organizations that have used this sort of model um, where they bring on a student. You have to have somebody, I think, in-house that is managing all of it and setting up um, that structure, but then you do have um, some relatively eager and cheap, if not free, um, labor. And what the students get out of it, I mean, they're just thrilled to be um, seeing what, uh, what organizations are doing and getting some of the skills that they would get. So yes, you need somebody in-house that's going to right. kind of set it up and be your right. consistent. Right. Doris, is there a large fee for an evaluator? like a Tom? I guess that's, um, it depends on your perspective. It's not cheap, no. <laughs> I was just talking with him today. Uh, he has, Dina, you don't know, he has agreed to do the five years of, uh, of the Caregiver Wellness Center. So um, yeah, okay. I think it's well worth the money though. Oh yeah, I agree. I just didn't know if we were looking at you know, five thousand dollars or fifty thousand. I, you know, I just somewhere yeah. in the middle. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and you might want to have a private conversation. Yes, this yes, call. yes. Yeah, because some yeah, of that may also depend on where you're located, right? Like, yeah. and what those costs are. Yeah. I mean, obviously, New York is going to be much different than some other states, but I mean, I think that's important for us as a group to be transparent on not exactly dollar amounts but there is a fee to this you know oh, absolutely yeah. so i think we have to be transparent and we yeah. need that as you know project manager managers to understand there's there you've got to find those individuals and there's a lot to think about as you guys have done and have fallen into a great resource so good good got good for you guys thank you yeah we don't want to think about what it would be like without <laughs> Oh my first cross, he stays around for as long as we're still working <laughs> in this area, right? Would you like me to, does anyone else have any other questions or do you want me to jump into the actual evaluation report? I'd love to see the report, but I, I'll let others ask questions first. Okay, go right ahead, Dina. I think you yeah. have a question in the yeah, chat. Yeah, Marilyn's got a question oh, in the chat. chat. Sorry. Would UCEDDs be a good resource for an evaluator? Maybe, maybe Susan can, coming out of a you said. Yeah, Susan. Uh, you I'm might sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, it definitely would. You just you you're gonna have to find the right person. So you have to think about like within you said. I think we had fourteen different disciplines at University of Washington, so. Um, you need somebody with evaluation expertise and also content expertise. So, um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a match because with Tom Caprio, he's evaluating for the lifespan because he knows the evaluation tools. But so, you know, it's hard to say where you might find them. Not, you can go to the USAID director or associate director and start the conversation there. And then you can do something like a hybrid, like Rebecca was talking about, I think you need somebody to kind of set that up for you, but um, you know that could be once you get somebody that does a kind of overall plan, then make part of that plan that student uh, intern, the rotating student intern. Um, if you don't have a strong plan to begin with, I think that's kind of hard to plug somebody in. Yeah. To you know, you kind of need the a strong framework. Right. before you do that part, but that's something you can grow toward, I think. The uh, Nebraska Lifespan Respite Network also partners very closely with their USAID for evaluation uh, and other services. And Nadine, you have Sooner Success. Are they not at the USAID? Certainly there must be some connections there. There is, already but have I that partnership. Like, yeah, I agree. There is that, but I kind of like to get somebody outside of that realm you know um not that no one connected someone completely outside of that but no you're right you're exactly right jill well i guess that makes sense in some of your programmatic work is within you said it might be um 
more objective to have someone from outside. This exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking about. I could go to the other university and probably get some good <laughs> information. The other big university. You know, one, two, I, I'm just looking at the time we've we're spending all our time, so that's great. But if you wanted to talk about the reporting and then we could circle back around for more questions. Sure. Okay. So you can see that the um, program evaluation report really structured the same way as he laid out the evaluation plan. Same title page with the partners and contact information and his information and the table of contents. Executive summary and all these things I know Jill shared links for so you can read, you know, read through it in more depth. Background, I just thought to Cassandra's point, we could maybe spend some time more on the actual outcomes. So. Here's where um, we have the outcome and indicators uh, listed again uh, with, um, he actually included here, it looks like some um, footnotes too. I think he gets into, if I recall, after this, he goes into more of the accomplishments and how they relate, I think, to the outcomes. Here's a breakdown of the train rest trainers. By county. Yeah, by county. <clears throat> wow. So oh, long. we have a lot more now. That was 2015. Wow. I think it was, I think it was, oh yeah, you're right, 2015. Well, we got 2015 some. Or we got I think some. it was 2018, Doris. Oh, I thought you had a 2015 report. 18. Up. Yeah, well, okay. we got some additional funding from the New York State Office for Aging specifically to roll out REST, uh, which is why we were able to blow Nevada out of the water uh, that year. <laughs> they, were, they were in quite the competition. That's when I came on board, right before the Alabama conference. And those two were like head to head. I remember that. That was a fun, oh, that was a fun uh, conference though. It was. <laughs> Okay, where was I? Down in the major accomplishments, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's where uh, what the trainers rated the curriculum and training as. Um, then uh, talking about the um, drop in respite centers uh, that were successfully implemented. And Doris, you can speak probably more um, about some of this work than I can with being more on the ground, but. Which, what? you're moving too fast. The rest training and just, oh. I think the way that he kind of lays out in the evaluation report, right? Um, some testimonials, um, yep. you know. And that, and that is all provided to him in spreadsheets and then he makes it look really pretty. One of the things that we've implemented with him just in the last few months is to, and, and Jill, I give you all credit for this because you're the one who introduced me to Dropbox when we did the conference, but we have a folder specifically for him in Dropbox where we can just put anything and everything that we want him to have. And there's not a whole lot of emailing and all that stuff. It makes it a lot easier. And I think for those of you who did not participate in the um, respite research summit, it might be good to to go back and listen to his presentation because he really talked a lot about his work with us and how he evaluates um, this data. So you know, the thing that Tom always drives home to me is that, you know, caregiver, 
care, it's hard to collect data on caregivers. It's really hard when you have um, their stories and their scenarios and the struggles and you know what they're going through. It, it's hard to put it into data sometimes and um, being open to really the narrative is, is really important. We may have to have Susan share a little bit about collecting qualitative data and analyzing it. So Susan, heads up, I might be tapping you because you're absolutely right uh, and Tom's right about the, the nuances and the sometimes you just can't survey and come up with an answer. But there are good ways and a, a classic field study using qualitative, uh, which is considered qualitative study. You actually do some enumeration and sampling it's calling, you do some counting and you can even count things that you collect during a conversation. And yeah, at some point how we did that with a respite program that I had years ago, um, a crisis nursery program, and it really did a good job of capturing what was going on with families without being too intrusive. I'd be interested in that. I, I always say, you know, families are messy business. There's no, there's, it's not black and white. It's not cut and dried. Um, and, and I'm not sure how to capture that, Susan, but I'd be very interested in that. Sure, so, and we can have a we can have a conversation about that too sometime when you have time just over the phone. So I don't know if you want me to go back up. We can look more at the the outcomes section, but I mean, basically, you see how it's broken up into all these various sections of um, the data collection and the, and the area of work. Oh, Jill just put in a link to Tom's uh, presentation. Wonderful, thank you. You know, I think it's really helpful that Tom has um, helped facilitate our sustainability work. It certainly gives him a, a clear understanding and sense of what we're doing. Um, but um, he, he just, we just did a, another sustainability summit virtually. Um, we had about a hundred people on this, from the state on the call. Um, and we really have some strong direction on which way and how we're going to go forward with advocacy. Um, and we just had, uh, we're trying to build our advisory board and we just had six people on the advisory board volunteer to go on the, on the advocacy subcommittee. So I'm just really thrilled um, that we're gonna be able to take the coalition to the next level That's that awesome. way. Just looking at this, I, I don't know what you paid, but I think you, you're getting your money's worth. <laughs> That's how we feel. But. Yeah. Yeah. Looks very comprehensive. I have another question. I'm sorry, I get in the weeds on this stuff. Please. So when we, being with the state of Oklahoma, I did you guys have to go out for an RFP on him? We just can't. I don't know. I was not there at the time but i do not think so no i think and i hear what you're saying maybe and that was why when we started talking about it but i think because of the way we're structured with the core team and being that it's lifespan of greater rochester that goes into a contractual agreement with him um we we don't have to there are new rules. There are new rules in our agency that if it's over ten thousand dollars, that you have to bid it out for RFP. But I don't think that those rules existed at the time. Gotcha. You're lucky because I'd have to go out for an RFP on this. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Just again, I'm. I'm. My wheels are spinning. I'm yeah. Not and I and I totally. I we totally get it. <clears throat> and I also think like because of the, you know historical relationship yeah. and you know what he's been able to do and I think even if you had to go out 
you could make it so that the person really was right somebody who had the skill set and knowledge to be able to partner on it um we we've been fortunate with that i don't know what would happen if that was you know i i think even if we had to do it he he likely come in right and win because of right right you're, but you've you've got that and i'm um, going for you for sure in, in my case writing it up you know a lot of work. And it'll take it'll take me a year just to get a contract in place with somebody yeah with the yeah. state agency you know right. that's that's the hiccups we get into um you know you want to do it and it drags on forever just getting such things in place you know? what about the coalition the coalition are they in the like would they be able to do it faster i guess is what i'm asking well we'd still have to go out for bid because i'd be using lifespan money to pay them and they're not in i mean the coalition's not established like that to make contracts and to do that we pretty much do that for anything that comes up like that so they that's do, a good thought but they're the their own 501c3 right that we're was, not no okay. we don't have our 501c3 okay i think that was another upside to housing the coalition at an existing nonprofit. you know that already had a good established network of partners yeah yeah makes sense so then we get into where he does um identify some mm -hmm. gaps And there you go. And right there on the top, we're implementing our voucher program. So right. we're still on track. We're a little behind, but on track. Right. So at least, you know, it does show it wasn't implemented um, and, you know, why, but um, we're back at it. And this time it will be successful, right, Doris? <laughs> Absolutely. The way he does the analysis, which I think is interesting too, um, that he uses the same questions that we do for the final report. So, but his focus is different, right? So. We have a question from Corey. How are you going to be doing your voucher program? <laughs> that could be a whole different meeting. <laughs> but does anyone wanna? Well, I can, I mean, I can give you a quick overview. We, you know, we, <clears throat> we've implemented the voucher program. Um, we have two tracks. Kinship families uh, is a huge need in our state. There are no supports for kinship families. And we are, and being a kinship family myself, uh, I have a passion for that. And uh, we have a pot of money for long-term chronic conditions, uh, caregivers and folks with long care chronic conditions that aren't covered by um, long-term Medicaid, long-term care support. So we're also considering it as gap funding because of the workforce shortage. If people are on waiting lists, they would still be eligible for our funding, even though they had Medicaid eligibility. And Corey, um, you probably know about the Voucher Learning Collaborative. So uh, please feel free to reach out to Doris or Dina and ask them about their vouchers. Uh, but also think about the, I don't know if you've been in the learning collaborative, but there is a collaborative on vouchers. I think I've been invited to that, but I would love a, a, a new invitation for that since my program is strictly voucher program. Okay. So, well, Jill is on the line and I know she's written she's your name down. Writing it down right now. Okay. You were part of that group, Corey, but our next meeting is January 20th. I probably am, but I have so many that I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was probably the case. Yes. I will add that one of the it was in, it's interesting and just to go to show like how long things take, right? So Doris and I teamed up back in 2018 and went around the state and did five regional caregiver forums. Um hoping to help our network know what available resources were for kinship caregivers and to encourage our triple a's in particular to kind of partner more with kinship programs and and consider um developing services for kinship caregivers with their title three e funds um 
we were well received. We partnered with the New York State Kinship Navigator. And so they kind of talked about the services that they offer. We talked about the services we offer. They invited their network. We invited our network. It was, it was great, but we really didn't see anything in follow up. Um, we, I think, have only spent about 1% of our total 3E funds on older relative caregivers, which to me is very sad because we know there's a need. Um, so we said, you know, let's have a discussion about other ways that we can try to meet those needs since we were not having as much success in laying out like why our AAA network should really be serving these caregivers. Um, so that was, I would say, the reason that we kind of targeted the kinship programs um, for the vouchers, uh, hoping to fill that gap. You know, I would like to stop you just for a minute because I, I, I see people are needing to leave the meeting mm -hmm. and I would love to quickly do a poll because it's about future meetings. So would you object if I just quickly did a poll and then we'll come back and have more on that reporting? Uh, and I'm going to actually, before I do this, I'm going to turn you guys into... Um, Maybe Jill can do this because I want you to have the opportunity to answer to the poll. So I'm going to take away your status as, um, oh man, maybe I don't know how to do it. More just sec. Uh, I don't, uh, Dina. I was able to respond to the poll. You were, I think yes. you were. I don't, I don't think Dina was. So I'm going to withdraw your permission. Sorry about that, Dina. And uh, Abby, I don't think I made you a presenter. So I'm going to share that poll again. And this is on um, this is on what topics you would like uh, for future meetings. And we've already identified a few just through our discussion. But if you could uh, let us know, have a quick look at this, and then we'll go back. So I, I hope I apologize for interrupting. I just don't want to lose the opportunity. So can you see the poll? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. No. I'm wondering if the few people who haven't responded, they might be uh, arch staff, the three of us. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to wrap it up and just uh, just now. If you don't mind, okay, seven of 10. Okay, I'm just gonna wrap it up. And um, actually, it looks like, I hope you can see the results. Choosing data elements to measure, and actually that ties right into logic models, using data for planning, uh, education, advocacy, evaluation tools. I think we'll have this covered. I'm surprised we didn't have more on partnering with universities, uh, but I'm, I'm going to address what you guys have mentioned here. So thank you, Dina, sorry to do that to you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we got it before other people left. So please take it away again. Queries, I think I was almost through it uh, anyway, yeah. but we'll um, go through, I think it was, we were at the, like the last question and again, I just actually found the 2020 um, or 2017 to 2020. So I did share that with Jill. I think she put it in the chat, which is a little more current. Um, you can take a look at that as well. And then it goes right into the appendices with um, further data. So if you look at this on your own and have questions, please feel free to reach out um, to Doris or I. Doris probably will have better answers when it comes to the data than me, but I'm happy to, to try to answer any questions that you may have. 
we've been using this map for rest. Um, we're down to five counties now left for coverage, although we are not exactly sure how many we lost with um, the pandemic. So Karen, because she's doing such wonderful work, um, the coalition is going to hopefully help us get to a new starting point and figuring out where where we're having to kind of rebuild. But break sit down into region of all the trainers, which is great because they're all from different organizations and their caregiver self assessment questionnaire. And Jill has a link to this report. She put it in earlier in chat. And I just sent uh, Cassandra, you and Jill, the, the current evaluation report from the 2017 Wonderful. to 2020. Thank you. And I think that's it. And this was the program evaluator, evaluator activities log. So he kind of lays out too, like all of the um, work that went into the evaluation, which is nice to kind of reflect and see as well. So I'm in agreement with you, Cassandra. I think that we get a lot for what we pay for, but I know, you know, it is limited money and, you know, sometimes you have to think about what you're potentially taking away, but I think there's so many, you know, things you can use this evaluation report that will just keep advancing and building um, for additional services. So if you look at it that way, it might be taken away right now, but might help to provide more in the future. I want to thank you. Or before we close, are there any other questions? This is a this is not your last opportunity because everyone's only a phone call away or an email away. But um, if you have any questions, now's your chance. Yeah, this is Jill. Can I just ask a quick question about the rest trainers? And you may have said this earlier and I apologize if I missed it. I had a lot of caregiving emergencies I was having to step away for for a few minutes. Do, do you also collect data on, you know, once the rest trainers are trained, uh, if they continue to um, provide the training and how, you know, how many people are trained and how many actually go on to provide respite services? Yep, we have a monthly reporting uh, mechanism through our website. It's a closed uh, page and they go in and put in how many companions they've trained uh, or, or we put it or we track how many trainers we've trained. Yeah, that's a continuing uh, data collection. But do, do they actually stay in touch with the people they've trained to find out if they're providing respite and how often? You know, that's the biggest challenge. Um, we at one point did this huge outreach to every rest trainer um, and companions to see if they were still involved. We got, you know, we got some data that was several years ago. We're embarking on that again because of COVID. Um, you know, one of the one of the supportive parts of the rest pieces that we require rest training through our mini grants. So if they want the mini grant money, they have to use it. They have to use the rest training for their volunteers. So at least during the time that they are receiving funds from us, we get great data. Um, it's going to be even better because we have Karen who's like sending out monthly emails to get the data and those kinds of things. But Yes, we know who they are, we know where they are, and we are in the process of finding out um, if they're still active. It's tough because you lose people through attrition, you know, they change jobs, those kinds of things, they retire. Um, so it's hard to keep track uh, of the numbers, but every now and then we just try and make a, do a huge outreach to see where we're at which is what we're no, doing. I mean, that, that's why I was asking because doing some of those longitudinal mm. studies to keep track of who you've trained and what they're doing with that training can be difficult. So if you had any insights, I thought it might be useful for our other training project. Well, um, one of the things that we're doing is long-term goals and outcomes. One of the things that we do in that and in powerful tools is uh, we have fortunate to have funding from another source where we can pay for all the powerful tools materials. So 
we tell them they just have to reach out to us if they're doing a training and we give them the books for free for their caregivers. And that's a huge incentive to get them to continue to report. Incentives, yes, those are important. Thank we you, Doris. We tried an incentive one time though that failed. Remember, Doris, you, we, we like came up with the idea of trying to like do a raffle of a gift card or something for like- Yeah, the, one person showed up and she won the raffle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the other, like the ongoing technical assistance calls, right, for the trainers or well, something. Well, we tried, we tried yeah. doing monthly calls and then we went to quarterly calls and um, it, I don't know if people are just too busy or, you know, what the deal is, but it takes a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one kind of outreach to get the information that we need. Yeah. Well, we all know when there's no money, right, it's, it's hard, there's nothing like but there's no hook, right? Of like forcing right. them to kind of bring right. that data back to us. So that is very challenging. Which is data. one of the biggest challenges for me is that the only, we can only require people to report to us while they're receiving funding. And then once their funding is done, they don't, there's no obligation for them to continue to report to us. We do try to continue to reach out to them. We do have several uh, faith communities that continue to faithfully report in another county, um, but it's it's difficult when there's no when there's no carrot attached. Of course, we've thought about in Oklahoma doing something similar to that to have the the mini grants to the you know like faith based. How much do you have to offer them to? as a mini grant to take it to do it we've put out anywhere from five thousand to twenty five thousand dollars the last round of mini grants we said no less we would give no less than ten thousand because just the work of tracking uh faith community people down who generally have no experience in running these programs or in data collection or data reporting is brutal. So um, for our own benefit, we went for the higher mini grants this round, but they will, they will jump at $5,000. And, yeah. and when you're really trying to push volunteer programs, oftentimes they have a volunteer who will run the program and what they're spending their money on is supplies. Yeah. I think in 2017, we actually had two at 2,500 too, which I was kind of surprised. Wow. I think you have to think of it as, you know, 10,000 for them and 10,000 for me to keep, to get the data, you know, to keep higher staff to gather the data. It's almost like you have to have some, a, a good staff person behind you to, to put that money out there for many grants. That's been my experience, but good for you so, guys. Let me just tell you about Erie County, which is in the Buffalo area. And they have 25-ish faith communities that are doing uh, either monthly or bi-monthly respite. And that was initiated by the Office for the Aging there. And they continue to do this. They say, we'll give you $1,000 if you'll start a respite program. And they have been able doing that to have multiple programs and they have this incredibly huge network um, where there's multiple options for respite all around the Buffalo area. I think it, there's over 30. Over wow. 30. And it is, and now they have the support of the ADCSI grant, the Alzheimer's disease uh, grant from DOH. And they, they have the same challenge with the data. Because oh, they have the same challenge with the data, but they, but the question was, you know, what does it take to get them to be able to, to start a program right. financially? And it doesn't take much Not at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I hate to do this. We've got one minute left and I know many of us have other meetings. I hope that those unanswered questions, you guys are going to pick up the phone or you type out their emails because here's a great opportunity for you to learn more from each other. Um, so I think what I want to do is thank you guys so much. This was so uh, invigorating. I really appreciate the work you've done for us and happy holidays to everyone. Any closing comments? Thanks for having us. Happy yep. holidays to you and to everyone on the call. Okay. Thank you all. Bye, Bye everyone. See you next time. Next year. Happy holidays, next year. <laughs>